All right, let's get started. Uh, good morning. Welcome to the 2023 Federal Health at Home Technology Summit. My name is Shayla Salimovich and I work at the Department of Health and Human Services, the Administration for Strategic Preparedness and Response and the Biomedical Advanced Research and Development Authority, or BARDA. Some may recall the 2021 Federal Wearable Summit, where we discussed issues surrounding wearable physiological monitors. Today, we are expanding that topic to at-home health te technologies much more broadly. Um, we hope today's discussion will prompt people to engage more with this topic, to be curious, and to continue to learn about it. A few housekeeping items before we launch the, uh, 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 the meeting officially. Please send any questions and comments to fedsummit at hhs.gov. Uh, all of your meeting invitations should have that email. Uh, the chat and audio functions in Teams have been disabled, so please communicate with us and reflect on the sessions via email. We will have a one half hour break, uh, but people can call into any session using the same link that you've used to connect in the morning. With that, I would like to welcome Dr. Gary Disbro, who is the Director of the Biomedical Advanced Research and Development Authority, and Dr. Ryan Vega, the Chief Officer of the Office of Healthcare Innovation and Learning at the Department of Veterans Affairs. Um, Dr. Disbro, welcome. Great, thanks, Shayla. Really appreciate it. And good morning, everybody. And as Shayla mentioned, welcome to the Federal Health and at Home Technology Summit. I want to thank all participants for attending, our USG partners, partners from the private sector, healthcare providers, and end users of these innovative uh, technologies. This conference is organized by Asper Barta and our government partners at HRSA, the VA Office of Healthcare Innovation and Learning, and the National Institute on Aging at NIH. I appreciate the collegial spirit of our USG partners to bring innovative technologies forward to improve healthcare for all Americans. Since its inception, Research Innovation and Ventures, or DRIVE, has invested in bringing innovative technologies for uh, health assessment and monitor monitoring to the home. I worked closely with and supported the mission of the BARDA DRIVE Early Notification to Act, Control, and Treat, or an ACT program, with the desire to develop new solutions to detect infection as early as possible. As part of the ENACT program's evolution, DRIVES created its current Bringing Laboratory Testing to the Home program, which supports the development of novel platform technology and reliable at-home alternatives to traditional central laboratory testing. In response to the coronavirus pandemic and to better prepare us for the future, DRIVE and BARDA's Detection, Diagnostics, and Device Infrastructure Divisions are partnering with companies to develop novel pathogen sensing technologies for rapid, accurate, and affordable. It has been and will continue to be to develop medical countermeasures that develop the technologies to detect early infections and limit the spread of pathogens. We and other government agencies have an even broader interest in leveraging health at home to revolutionize diagnostics and chronic disease management, leading to a healthier population and a more resilient healthcare system. The USG agencies will share with the public considerations for developing these health at home technologies and the role federal agencies can play in advancing development of these innovative technologies. I hope you'll find today's meeting engaging, and I encourage all to actively participate in the discussions. We really need your input to move these programs forward. So I'm now gonna hand it off to Ryan Vega, who is the Chief Officer for the Office of Healthcare Innovation and Learning in the VA Office of Discovery, Education, and Affiliated Networks. Off to you, Ryan. Thanks, Gary, uh, and echo your comments. I really appreciate everyone uh, across the federal government and their collegiality in putting this on. This topic is important for many reasons, not just in the VA, but as healthcare struggles with continual challenges on the supply side. The two or the top two items that keep CEOs and healthcare up at night are staffing uh, and finance, and finance driven by the challenges with staffing. More and more care has the opportunity to move outside of the walls of the traditional hospital, to meet patients where they are and to create a new sense of connection 
between patients and the health systems or the individuals that care for them. Technology is going to play a fundamentally important role in helping us get there and helping us reimagine what traditional healthcare looks like. But that doesn't come without the challenges and the opportunities. We'll have to wrestle with challenges around security and privacy. We'll have to wrestle with challenges of how these technologies integrate into the workflows, not just for providers, but for health systems themselves. The way that we pay for these types of solutions and these new models of care will have to be tested, will have to be stressed, will have to be proven. And we also have to resist the challenge to go back to the way things were pre-pandemic. We have to continue to push forward. We have to continue to embrace sometimes the discomfort on the provider side of enabling these new technologies to allow our patients to have more control, to have more engagement and more autonomy over their own healthcare. I'm really excited for today. And again, really appreciate everyone being here. I think these types of convening forums and these types of events are vital for us to continue to learn from one another and to continue to come together to push American healthcare innovation forward. Sandy. Hey everyone. There you go, sorry. Hey everyone, uh, thanks Ryan uh, and thanks Gary. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, welcome to the to the Health at Home Summit. Uh, my name is Sandeep Patel. I'm the, the director of, of BARDA Drive. Um, and I'm speaking to you from my home uh, in Washington, D.C. Um, so first off, I'd like to thank uh, and share my deep gratitude to all the speakers and the organizers. Um, you heard from Ryan uh, at the VA Office of Healthcare Innovation and Learning. Um, we also have the National Institute on Aging at NIH um, and, and others that have helped organize this. So this is, it's a fantastic star-studded light up. Uh, I'm really excited for this, uh, for the conversation. Um, and of course, thanks to all of you uh, participants for tuning in um, uh, to today's session. Um, so let's dial the clock back uh, three years. Uh, in early March, um, as coronavirus was spreading, uh, the lockdown started. Um, CMS, the Center for Medicare and Medicare Services, uh, put out a series of guidances um, on expanded uh, and, and flexible telehealth policies to allow Medicare beneficiaries to uh, receive telehealth services from any location. Uh, previously, it was it was uh, mostly directed in, in rural um, environments, but but this opened up uh, uh, telehealth um, uh, in in homes across the country. Uh, other payers followed suit. Um, this also included emergency department visits, uh, uh, nursing facility, discharge visits, home visits, physical, occupational, uh, speech therapy. I myself uh, had just recovered from uh, an ACL reconstruction on my knee and I was do doing physical therapy uh, virtually um, early in the pandemic. Uh, clinicians also could uh, suddenly uh, practice medicine across state borders, which created entire new opportunities for, for telehealth uh, business models. So like a light switch in, in March 2020, uh, we flipped on nationwide telemedicine services. Um, and so this, this led to vast improvements or increases in utilization. So I think the um, GAO found that telehealth services increased by an order of magnitude by 10x uh, among Medicare uh, patients. Um, uh, another survey found 60% uh, of participants uh, said that you know, telehealth was more convenient than in-person medicine. 40% said they'd continue using it after the pandemic. Uh, more than 60% wanted expanded telehealth service uh, options uh, overall. Uh, but telemedicine, I would argue, was still fundamentally incomplete at the time. Um, you know, at the time, if you had suspected coronavirus uh, infection or needed to be tested, you still had to go into a central facility to get swabbed and tested. Um, that, of course, has now changed with, with the introduction and availability of, of home testing, uh, thanks in part to my colleagues uh, across BARDA and NIH and FDA and others uh, who, who made that happen. Um, as well as our industry partners. Um, but if you were diabetic, uh, you had to go to a central lab to get your A1Cs measured. If you had kidney disease, you still had to go to a central lab to get your creatinine levels measured. If you were on dialysis, you still had to go into a dialysis facility uh, to, to receive care. Um, and what we were most worried about at the time, as, as you all can, can recall, I'm sure, uh, was to stop community spread of the virus. Um, yet, we had a system that uh, the, often the most vulnerable patients had to go into places that put them at the greatest risk of infection. So what was at the time and still is missing is health at home technologies. 
that that I would argue is sort of the missing puzzle piece um, uh, in this. And so if we get back on the, the Wayback Machine and go even further back to the 60s, uh, the introduction of Medicare and Medicaid actually introduced um, and well helped ramp up the, the use of uh, uh, hospital-based care uh, um, um, in the U.S. Uh, prior to that, you know, hospitals were, were beginning to form, but, but you know, way back in the, the 19th century, you know, the predominant modality of care was, was at home. Um, that, of course, switched to, to, to the hospital. Uh, and now we're back in a situation where um, uh, emerging technologies such, such as uh, at-home diagnostics, analytical devices, health monitoring tools, they're putting health at home back on the agenda, right? So we're, we hear this everywhere. Um, and, and what's interesting about this is that these uh, at-home testing devices, I mean, they have the opportunity to become real game changers in, in things like preventative care, chronic disease management, um, but also to help us detect infection early to avoid community spread like we saw in the pandemic. Um, uh, everything from basic telemedicine services of, of audio, video, you know, uh, communication modalities, talk to your doctor, but also what we're talking about in terms of emerging technologies of novel ways to do uh, lab testing at home, of, of doing early detection, uh, uh, health monitoring and things like that. Um, but I also think it's wrong for us to think about health at home technologies as just a way to recreate the clinical visit we're all familiar with in the home. So first off, most people or many people in the US, I should say, sorry, uh, don't have ready access to clinical care. Um, so health at home technologies have the, the opportunity to actually expand uh, care. Uh, in a Pew survey, I think it was two thirds of, of rural residents uh, uh, mentioned that healthcare access was a problem. Um, you know, uh, many folks across the country don't have access to primary care physicians. Um, another survey found that 40% of US counties uh, are you at our trauma center deserts right where where more than 50 percent of the population has to travel more than an hour to reach a hospital equipped to handle uh, traumatic injuries um, so we really have an access to care problem and telemedicine telehealth health at home technologies as an opportunity to, to plug that and to kind of uh, introduce that to to a population that didn't have access secondly um, health and home technologies, I think, offer us an opportunity to, to re-engineer uh, and enhance the clinical experience and think about it very differently than we do right now. Um, as Ryan mentioned, uh, these technologies have an opportunity to actually increase patients' empowerment over their own health, uh, access to their data, um, um, uh, can help them manage complex health uh, conditions, disabilities um, in, in entirely new ways right now. Um, at-home physiological monitoring also gives us opportunities to develop uh, uh, check engine light systems for, for our own health, right, where, where we might come up with new ways to, to sort of flag uh, issues of concern and seek, and seek care in different ways. Communication technologies obviously can enable new ways to communicate with clinicians, but also with other patient groups, again, to, to improve sort of different modalities of care. Uh, but we have a lot of challenges to solve, uh, and you're going to hear a lot about these today. We have access issues, um, you know, internet connectivity, um, unfamiliarity, especially among elderly patients, uh, to some of the technologies. We have design and usability issues. Um, you know, uh, um, there's still a struggle to to access, uh, and and the design of these tools itself may not be uh, optimal. And we have opportunities to improve that. There are data reliability issues uh, that can hinder trust, particularly among clinicians, um, in in the utility of these technologies uh, in in current standards of care, but to enhance them as well. Um, there are, of course, new risks of fraud uh, that, that we have to manage and mitigate as a result of this. And we have a business model problem, right? We, this, is entire, this introduces entirely new ways to, again, to, to manage care, to get information to, um, uh, and, you know, we need to think about the, the business model innovation, the reimbursement structure that's going to help facilitate that in the right way um, for the benefit of patients at the end of the day. Um, and what you're going to hear today, too, uh, is that you know, multiple federal agencies, you know, the VA, NIH, DOD, many others have uh, really come together working with the private sector to advance uh, some of these technologies from an investment perspective, from a care delivery perspective, from a reimbursement policy uh, and other perspectives uh, that, that, you know, should be that come to bear on to this. Um, so I think it's important for us to come together as a community to learn from one another, to understand the pain points uh, for patients, clinicians, payers, caregivers, technologists, regulators, so we can collectively advance the, the field forward in a way that benefits uh, you know, our own health and the health of the population uh, today and in the future. 
Um, and from my perspective, to, to make us more resilient against uh, future pandemics and other health emergencies. Um, so I want each and every one of you, my goal for today, my, my ask of everyone is to come away today learning something new, to, to find someone you want to talk to afterwards, and to, uh, to, to have one, uh, one idea, one action that you can kind of take away from the meeting uh, that in your spheres of influence, and trust me, all of you have your own spheres of influence to, to push and advance the field forward. Um, we want to hear from you, uh, as Shayla mentioned, so uh, you can submit questions, I think, through the Q&A on Teams, but correct me if I'm wrong on that. Um, and you can send inquiries to fedsummit at hs.gov. Um, so I will stop there. Enjoy the meeting. Uh, thank you very much.